We are recording and I will admit everyone right now. Um, video, I'm going to turn my video off uh, other than the presenter. All right, have a good time. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jose Perez and I'm the president and CEO of uh, Hispanics in Energy. We're a nonprofit organization uh, that was created in 2012. Uh, to drive Hispanic inclusion into the $3 trillion uh, energy business in the country. It's a very significant uh, um, part of the industry, is a significant part of the economy for the country. Uh, and they, uh, the, the industry hires millions of people uh, and uh, employs uh, millions of people. And so uh, it's because of that that we are um, focusing on energy and, and today we are extremely happy that we were able to partner up with the uh, Arizona Corporation Commission with uh, Commissioner uh, Leah Marquez Peterson. And uh, thank you very much Commissioner uh, for uh, helping us lead this. Uh, and with uh, Commissioner uh, Satsi Marta Oliva from uh, Illinois, who has been a champion in uh, on this issue with utility commissions around the country and you'll get a chance to hear from her. Uh, and uh, the idea uh, that we're gonna be focused on today is how do we increase the number of Hispanic youth that are going into uh, energy STEM uh, in, uh, in the country? Because uh, it's something that uh, we have observed uh, is a very critical step that we need to take. Uh, and I'll give you one example. Uh, there's 2,700 energy companies around the country. And of those only seven are led by Latino CEOs. Uh, and the reason for that is we have such a small number of Latinos who are in the STEM occupations working for a lot of these energy companies. So, uh, so we've set a, a goal to try to, to uh, deal with that. And so um, I have a, a very quick uh, overview of uh, PowerPoint uh, information that I think you're gonna find uh, interesting to, to uh, try to understand what we saw and why we um, decided to take action on it. And uh, clearly uh, this state is the first one that does this. So we're uh, very delighted uh, that uh, we're engaging in this fashion. So uh, Anita, if you could please go ahead and put uh, the uh, first, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, first uh, page up. Uh, this uh, initiative uh, we call the Hispanic American Energy STEM Institute. Uh, it really is a, a focus to try to increase uh, Hispanic representation in engineering, chemistry, physics, environmental science, atmospheric science, biology, and mathematics. And uh, uh, last year, uh, we um, had some very strategic meetings, one with the Department of uh, Energy and HACU, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, who are having their convention this year. Uh, they represent the 530 or so Hispanic serving institutions around the country. And we gathered in San Antonio of all places uh, to basically lay out uh, how uh, we would um, uh, launch this initiative with some very important stakeholders. Uh, in uh, preparation for that, uh, we uh, prepared a resolution and we can go ahead and go to the next page, uh, Anita. And, uh, and uh, uh, the reason we decided to make this investment on the Hispanic American Energy STEM Institute, clearly, as you well know, uh, Hispanics are 60 million of uh, Americans, 18% of the total population. And if you look at the K-12 profile of uh, kids in school, 25% of those are, are Hispanic. Uh, they have a, a tremendous uh, purchasing power. It's growing. They have an, a tremendous work ethic, uh, they're family oriented, they shun welfare, they're business friendly, they're healthy, they're patriotic, and they are America's workforce of today and the future. Um, and uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, this uh, slide uh, tries to share with you what the challenge is. Uh, today's challenge, as you can see in that first K-12 uh, green part, uh, those are the kids, the Latino kids to stay in school. Uh, but in many states, uh, the dropout rate for Latino kids is almost 50%. In other words, they don't make it out of high school. And as you can see, as that dropout in, it gets in, increases over time, uh, it's a very significant uh, number that uh, cuts into the potential uh, in the community. And so consequently, I think last year we had uh, probably less than 20 PhDs in the energy space and mathematics space uh, in the, for the whole country. And so we, you know, we really got to change that. 
And so, um, so we, we took a look at the whole K-12 system all the way up to PhD. If, uh, if uh, we were to have a perfect world, if you will, uh, we thought, well, okay, how, how could we shape tomorrow's opportunities? And the idea is to uh, increase the uh, graduation rate of Latinos from K-12 uh, from the community college. And of course, uh, to um, uh, some of these other uh, higher level uh, uh, the PhD and, and so forth. And so next slide. Uh, so so uh, how do we do that? You know, uh, we have to fix uh, Latino uh, student K-12 graduation rate because that that pop the pipeline uh, and that part of it is uh, is basically creating a, a a lack of sufficient numbers, adequate number of, of children that should be going into this uh, area. But uh, you know, if we're losing half of them before they get out of high school, then it uh, we're losing half of the potential. And so uh, then we if they if they graduate, uh, we do have a program that uh, fixes that. Uh, and if, but if they graduate in sufficient numbers, obviously they go to community college, which is uh, one of the key stakeholders that are here today. Uh, same thing with the uh, four-year uh, college education. Uh, and uh, you know, we want to have an intentional program that produces X number of Latino energy STEM graduates every year. So uh, go ahead, next slide. Hmm. Let's see why is it and so this was founded in. Uh, November 18th uh, last year in uh, in San Antonio and so our symbol will be that uh, that Alamo and for those of you who are historians you'll appreciate that concept uh, and next slide the um, initiative has uh, got several co-collaborators besides ourselves it's the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners and you will hear from uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Oliva in, in a little bit uh, the others are Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities and the Hispanic Serving Institutions, Excelencia in Education, uh, SHIP. They're also having their convention uh, today. We have a, a key friend, uh, Dr. Zach Valdez. It's actually uh, you know, the lead of this project. Uh, the Mexican American Engineering Society, National Center of Jobs for Progress, the Parent Institute for Quality Education, that's the group that fixes that K-12. What they have is an incredible program that produces 96% high school graduation rates. And then those kids, 72% of those kids go on to college. And so we just need to duplicate that program nationally. Uh, Teleku Education Foundation, which is uh, out of Los Angeles. And of course, uh, you can see the rest of our, our co-collaborators. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, NARUC adopted a resolution. Uh, this is the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, which is how we associate ourselves with utility uh, commissions in, in, in Arizona, the Arizona Corporation Commission. And this uh, particular resolution, as you can see, uh, encourages inclusion of minority serving institutions in the development of long-term strategic partnerships to address uh, pending retirements of utility professionals. And so it's and, uh, and there's additional information on there about uh, how that is done. And so uh, we have interpreted uh, this uh, resolution that we helped craft uh, to mean that uh, the utility commissions will help us uh, gather the energy industry uh, leaders with the Hispanic serving institution leaders and talk about how we can partner up together to improve the uh, the pipeline and creation of uh, sufficient numbers of uh, STEM graduates. Uh, next uh, slide. And so very simplistically, uh, step one would be obviously to so solve that K-12 uh, issue. And we've got uh, some strategies for that, but step two and three, next slide, uh, is uh, uh, the part that we're working on here, which is to implement the NARUC resolution in states to facilitate uh, the energy uh, uh, and uh, Hispanic serving institutions uh, to partner with each other and, and with the intent of increasing the number of Hispanics being educated and trained for energy STEM careers. And, and of course, beyond that, we also have a key objective to monitor this information. Uh, we know that it's gonna take many years to fix this. So, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're not just thinking about this thing, uh, you know, uh, doing this and then just kind of walking away. It's gonna take a lot of effort. So with that, uh, I want to uh, again, thank Commissioner um, uh, Leah Marquez uh, Peterson from uh, Arizona. 
and uh, for helping us uh, pull this together. And uh, she's basically going to take over now and uh, um, assume the responsibility of uh, uh, conducting this very important conversation. And uh, you know, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. I think you're going to find this extremely stimulating and visionary and clearly a pathway for a very important segment of our community to engage in. So thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. And thank you, Jose. And I've got to tell you what an honor it is for the Arizona Corporation Commission and myself to partner with Hispanics and Energy. Uh, for those that may not be aware, uh, this is our second forum. We had a forum in the end of September that focused on supplier diversity. Uh, my particular background is running uh, the Tucson Hispanic Chamber and having been a small business owner for decades, it was really important to talk about supplier diversity and how they can engage with the energy sector. And in this session, as you know, is focused on workforce diversity. We have put together a pretty uh, dynamic, outstanding list of speakers um, to kind of give you a, a quick overview. We're gonna start with kind of that national level, the state of energy, why STEM is important. You've heard about the incredible project and programs that Hispanics and Energy is leading at the national level, uh, you're going to hear from Commissioner Oliva, uh, who leads our national effort at NARUC on supplier and workforce diversity. We're then going to hear from our K-12 uh, community college and university systems and find out what's working, what's not working, what resources they may need. And then ultimately, we'll hear directly from our electric utilities. We're very honored to have three of the largest uh, utility companies uh, as part of this forum to talk about programs they're currently supporting uh, and where they might need assistance in ensuring workforce diversity. And then we'll have some closing remarks. I wanted to ask folks, if you have questions as we're going through, be sure you feel free to put them in the chat. I will read them off to the panelists as we go. If by chance we don't get to all the questions, I'll be sure to email them to all the panelists so that you can hear directly from them. And we'll, before we start our, our panel with um, uh, at the national level, I did want to take the data that Jose had presented uh, nationally about the Latino community and bring that a little closer to home here in Arizona. Uh, in Arizona, we're proud again to partner with Hispanics and Energy, and I know it's HIE's intent to take this around the country to California, to Illinois, to other states. So I wanted to give you that perspective because I think we've got folks here on the, on the call who are from uh, various states around the country. Um, in Arizona, as you can imagine, we're about 35% Latino throughout the state of Arizona. Interestingly, though, where we uh, have a dramatic increase in numbers is the population of K through 12 that are Latino. We're almost 50% of our K through 12 population of the 1.1 million public school students, about 45% are Hispanic or Latino in the state of Arizona. Uh, we have a lot of Hispanic serving institutions. We're going to hear from a few a little later in this program, but there are 16 in the state of Arizona, which is really great. Um, but Jose also identified some of the, the national challenges we're facing with dropouts uh, and kids not moving on to pre perhaps a technical school or college. And I looked up the data in Arizona and about 25 or 21%, excuse me, of Latinos enrolled in college in a four-year college uh, it's 21% in the state of Arizona compared to 57% of non-Hispanic students. And in a two-year college, that's 28% compared to 48%. And I know that not every student's pathway is into college, and certainly our technical education programs have grown dramatically here uh, in Arizona, but we wanted to ensure today that we were providing um, collaboration, we were building connections, we are building relationships between our HSI or Hispanic serving institutions, our universities, community college and K through 12 system with our, our large utilities that are uh, already massive employers in the state and they're continuing to grow because energy and electricity in this case is so vital to the growth of Arizona. Um, so just wanted to kind of lay the stage there for you in terms of what's happening in the state of Arizona. And then now let's jump into our content. So we will start on our first panel on the state of energy in the Latino community, why is STEM important? And we're gonna hear from Anne Augustine, who's the deputy director of the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity at the Department of Energy. So Anne, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, excellent. Oh, thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's um, let me see if I start my video here. 
there. Um, it's actually evening here in Washington, D.C., so it might seem a little dark to you. Uh, but it is a real pleasure to be with you uh, today. Um, and hopefully now it says join audio. Whoops, I think, are, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. good. Um, as a as a supporter of the energy industry, I've been with the Department of Energy 36 years, and I was an oil and gas attorney uh, in Houston, Texas for three years before then, um, and a strong believer in the value of diversity and inclusion. It is a particular honor for me to spend some time with you today. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to congratulate Jose Perez and Hispanic Sin Energy for their resilience in adapting to the current realities due to COVID-19 and to Commissioner Marquez Peterson for supporting these important conversations at such a critical time in the energy sector. As previously mentioned, my name is Anne Augustine, and I'm the Principal Deputy Director in the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity at the United States Department of Energy in Washington, D.C. In my role, I have the privilege of directing the Office of Minority Programs and the Office of Civil Rights and Diversity. Moreover, I support Director James Campos, who is presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed, uh, in advancing all of his strategic priorities, including the development and implementation of his trademark equity and energy initiative, about which I'll speak a little later this afternoon. Uh, for me, it is particularly special to be able to speak with you today, just a few days after the end of Hispanic Heritage Month, a time when all Americans take time to reflect on the countless contributions of Hispanics and Latinos to the building, shaping, and defending of the United States of America. The U.S. Census Bureau tells us that Hispanics will make up approximately 30% of the population by 2060. If we hope to remain a strong, thriving, vibrant nation, we need to ensure that Hispanics are engaged and invested in our future. This is especially true in the energy sector and STEM fields. It is for these reasons that the Department of Energy is playing a leading role in promoting STEM education in the Hispanic community, encouraging the involvement of Hispanic-owned businesses in energy, investing in programs to increase the representation of Hispanics in the energy workforce, and much more. At the Department of Energy, and especially at the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, we are committed to making a difference and ensuring that the energy sector continues to strive in the future with a skilled, prepared, and available workforce. And increasingly, that workforce is diverse, which means our collective efforts must be inclusive and representative. I know that you too value inclusion and, and the power that diversity brings to our industry. This month, uh, President Trump released the National Strategy for Critical and Emerging Technology, which outlines how the United States will promote and protect our competitive edge in wide-ranging technologies that are critical to the United States national security and our economic advantage. The strategy lays the foundation for the United States to continue to turn ideas into innovations, transform discoveries into co successful commercial products and companies, and protect and enhance the American way of life for many years to come. As, as Secretary of Energy Dan Briette said recently, the intersection of science and security is one of the most important issues of our time. And that is why President Trump's national strategy for critical and emerging technologies is vital to our long-term economic and national security. Now, the administration is taking a whole of government approach to protect American technology and intellectual property at our industries of the future uh, to make sure that they impact our daily lives. At the Department of Energy, we have taken energies to tighten compliance with respect to international science and technology cooperation across our national laboratory complex. We will continue to promote our national innovation base while protecting our technological advantage from adversaries. Critical and emerging technologies include fields like artificial intelligence, of which uh, Secretary Buyet just recently stood up a new office in the Department of Energy, our energy, quantum information science, communications, and networking technology, semiconductors, and space technologies. And yes, the Department of Energy is actually involved in space tech exploration. Some people would think that that's just NASA's domain, but DOE has um, a wide range of science applications um, it, with, under its umbrella. Now, uh, the United States has made historic progress on strengthening our leadership in technologies of the future, um, and U.S. will promote this innovative base and American leadership in science and technology through research and development, workforce development, and public-private partnerships. 
As our competitors and adversaries mobilize their vast resources in these fields, American dominance in science and technology is more important than ever. The United States will not turn a blind eye to the tactics of adversary countries, which will try to steal our technology, coerce companies into handing over intellectual property, undercut free and fair markets, and surreptitiously divert emerging civilian technologies to build their militaries. Um, we continue to defend the industry, address unfair practices, and create a level playing field for the American worker. Now, you put your act values into action, and so must we. At the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, our mission is to execute department-wide policies to strengthen diversity and inclusion goals affecting equal employment opportunities, minority businesses, minority educational institutions, and historically underrepresented communities. In so doing, we ensure that everybody is um, afforded an opportunity to participate fully in DOE's programs and opportunities. And I should mention that the office was created by statute in 1979 with the specific intention of making sure that all demographic groups are uh, allowed the opportunity to participate fully in a DOE's policies. And we've taken that a little further to say in the energy sector as well. Now, I appreciate the fact that you all share the belief that the energy sector must be inclusive, diverse, and prepared for the American future. Um, I would submit to you that Hispanics have played important roles in the energy industry and will continue to do so. According to the Census Bureau, 2019 was the first year in which non-whites and Hispanics were a majority under the age of 16, and that's pretty telling. Furthermore, by the year 2045, the nation will become a minority white community at 49.7%, with Hispanics at 24.6%, African Americans at 13.1%, Asian Americans at 7.9% and multiracial at 3.8%. So the statistics are showing that the, the future of America um, really depends on uh, making sure uh, that we are inclusive. Um, and, you know, we look from our office at women, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, uh, those who have historically been underrepresented in the STEM workforce and in STEM education. Um, and I think if Director Compost were here because he's very passionate about this and I agree with him, um, if we are to remain a prosperous nature, we have to change the trend. And we, it's really an economic and national security imperative that we boost the diverse representation in STEM and that we do it fast. We can't just cruise in that direction. We really have to step on the gas, so to speak. Uh, we can't H-1 visa out of the situation. We need to look at our domestic population, our domestic students, and prepare them for um, some of the great uh, positions and jobs that are in the energy sector. Uh, let me just mention a couple of ways that our office is addressing the STEM challenge. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks at the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, we've launched uh, the Equity and Energy Initiative to support the nation's energy goals by fostering entrepreneurship, innovation, and workforce partnership. That, uh, that initiative was officially launched in August of 2020, but it has been kind of in its formative stages for almost a year prior to that. Now, equity and energy focuses on the importance of increasing interest and access to the energy economy for individuals and understaffed communities. We aim to expand the inclusion and participation of individuals in these communities um, and in the private uh, energy sector as well. And we're looking at minorities, women, veterans, and formerly incarcerated persons. Um, the statutory mandate, as you note, I'm a lawyer, so I always mention this when the director is here, the statutory mandate that created a part of the office uh, focused uh, on specifically enumerated um, demographic groups. Um, but because the office houses our um, civil rights and diversity and inclusion offices, and it's my view that diversity permeates the entire organization, we were able to utilize that rationale uh, to allow us to uh, start creating um, programs for women in energy, veterans in energy, and starting a program for returning citizens um, 
from incarceration. And all of those um, groups are represented in the Depart in the Equity and Energy Initiative. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there are five core pillars, and I wish I'd actually um, brought at least a, a pictorial um, depiction of this for you. So bear with me. I don't want to be boring, but you should know the pillars are workforce development, STEM enhancement, supplier diversity, technical assistance, and energy affordability. In addition to those uh, pillars, uh, we're looking at uh, technology and artificial intelligence, entrepreneurship, um, opportunity zones, and workforce readiness for formerly incarcerated persons. And I would mention too that the core, at the core of these five pillars is something called interest and access. And obviously um, you have to generate interest, whether as students in school or historically underrepresented groups. If they don't know about this, they're never going to be able to participate fully. So part of the challenge we have at the Department of Energy um, is you know, partnering with people throughout the nation to help generate, cultivate that interest. But once you spark the interest, you also have to provide some sort of access. And that's, again, um, you have to have a nurturing uh, network of people that are there to help and encourage folks to, you know, get into the energy um, area. So um, it's really, um, it's a formidable undertaking, I would say. I also want to deviate here and just talk a little bit about opportunity zones, because Director Campos uh, is, you know, uh, on the opportunity zones for the Department of Energy, and he's spearheading it, and I'm assisting in that endeavor. Um, and as probably most of you know, all of the governors uh, were able to identify census tracts, and there are like 8,800 of them, I believe, throughout the country. Um, generally, those tracts um, are looking at impoverished um, groups where there's not a lot of economic development. Um, and there was a, in 2017, the president signed a, a tax relief bill that spurs economic development in qualified opportunity zones. And so um, you are, um, when we look at those, uh, the opportunity zones are not just to help enhance workforce development, but also looking at uh, educational institutions that reside in these qualified opportunity zones that might be the beneficiaries of some additional infusion of money. So that also is important in our overall strategy with the, um, the equity and energy. Um, our, we'd mentioned that recently our office issued 10 grants under what we call the Minority Education and Workforce Training Program. And I'm totally sorry, we're probably gonna have to wrap it up just a little bit, I apologize. Okay. Four million dollars that are addressing that. Um, I understand I'm going to have to work, talk a lot faster. Um, I also want to point out that we have a Minority Education Institution uh, Student Partnership Program known as MESAP, where we bring high school undergraduate and graduate students in for an eight to ten week um, summer internship program in both the District of Washington, D.C. and our national labs. Um, this year, we pivoted to uh, a virtual platform. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, after my speech, I'm happy, and, and Jose knows where to find me. Um, you know, I would love to give opportunities and, and um, the website address so that if you have any students that might be interested in a paid internship with the Department of Energy, that they know how to apply. The only requirement for our office is that they be a U.S. citizen. Um, a fabulous opportunity. We've um, had about 800 students go through this. Um, I know I'm being told that I have to move on quickly here. So um, I don't know how many more minutes I have, but I, I think in wrapping this up, um, I would say getting young people invested in STEM is vital for both the public sector and the private sector, particularly getting women and minorities involved. In closing, I implore you to remain engaged and involved in this effort. We need to continue to fill the energy sector's talent pipeline with one, a wonderful mosaic of ready and willing workers, and we know they're out there. We're relying on you and your partners to ensure our nation's future prosperity and competitiveness, and I salute you for your devotion to service and making a difference and encourage you to do so with pride, passion, and purpose. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so Thank much, you. and I appreciate it. Great information. And we're going to hear now from Commissioner uh, Satsi Oliva from the Illinois Commerce Commission. She also chairs, if you recall, the, the NARUC Subcommittee on Supplier and Workforce Diversity. Commissioner Oliva. OK, 
Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I, I want to start my video, um, but the host has to let me start it. But I don't want to take any time, so I will let that happen. Um, and I just want to say good afternoon to everybody in Arizona. But um, I'm here in Chicago where it is also uh, nighttime already, but it's such a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank you, uh, Commissioner Leah Marquez Peterson, for having this great event, uh, both at the end of last month and right now. Um, it's such an important topic, and I also want to thank uh, Jose Perez from Hispanics and Energy um, for inviting me to speak. Um, all of us on this uh, conference um, understand this alarming need for greater representation of Hispanics in the energy industry. Because when we look around at our own places of work and conferences and other industry forums, Hispanics are highly underrepresented. So it's critical that together we work on developing frameworks and communicate the need for diversity and include the utilities in this in this collaboration so that we can expand our sphere of influence. So the alarming statistics that we've heard since this conference started warned us to act and leverage the paths that have already been created to drive greater Hispanic inclusion across all utility sectors. Um, you, you heard the statistics, so there's an estimated 60 million Latinos in the US making up 18% of the population. And according to the Euro US Bureau of Labor Statistics, nearly 12% of the total employed in the utilities are Latinos. Um, but we wanna make those numbers better. Last year, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, known as NARUC, um, the Supplier and Workforce Diversity uh, Subcommittee, which I chair, proposed two historic resolutions that expand the encouragement for strategic partnerships to foster talented and diverse professionals in the utility industry and to engage um, diverse and financial and professional services providers by investor-owned utilities. So those were our two goals. The one I'm gonna to talk to you today is strategic partnerships, which relates directly to increasing Hispanic representation in the workforce. So a critical issue that our subcommittee has been addressing with its member members is increasing the workforce gap caused by the rapid rate of retirements in the energy industry. And it's reported to increase exponentially in the next 10 years. It's known as the silver tsunami. The loss of institutional knowledge and subject matter expertise because of those retirements could result in not only limiting training capabilities, but the need for greater inclusion in the industry. So to bridge the retirement epidemic and the need for greater inclusion in the industry, our subcommittee with the help of Hispanics and Energy proposed that NARUC expand its support of strategic partnerships with minority serving institutions and commissions, utilities, and other interested uh, stakeholders. And that way, the pipeline of Hispanic professionals begins. So the resolution champions the collaboration with minority serving institutions, specifically Hispanic serving institutions, to cultivate the next generation of utility professionals. And this will ensure a reliable and sustainable workforce. We collaborated with the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, Hispanics and Energy, and the California Public Utilities uh, Commissioner, former Commissioner, Timothy Allen Simon, in drafting this historic resolution. So it'll develop talent, hopefully, from early education in order to maintain and empower our current and future workforce. The NARU Board of Directors adopted unanimously the resolution on July 24th of last year, and it can be found under NARU's website under the resolutions index. 
In addition to the resolutions, the subcommittee continues to encourage diversity and inclusion in the utility industry through its programming and collaborative initiatives. I want to tell you a little bit about all of the exciting things we do in my state in Illinois, where I serve as a commissioner. We place a high value on diversity and inclusion at the Illinois Commerce Commission. It's one of the few states in Illinois, Illinois and California have statutory reported mandating of the utility spend in supplier diverse businesses. The Office of Diversity and Community Affairs at the Illinois Commerce Commission oversees the collection and the review of these annual reports from all of the utilities in Illinois. These reports include breakdowns of spending, procurement with women-owned, minority-owned, veteran-owned, and small businesses under state law. And once the reports are reviewed by the commission, we schedule a meeting with all of the utility CEOs, and it's a public forum, and they report to us on their progress. And we're very proud of our utilities. They've done such great work. Every year that spend gets better and better, and um, it creates a diverse workforce, supplier workforce. And I think um, what gets measured gets done. And that's why there's so much success in Illinois. And I just want to also mention, um, like Anne uh, before me, um, our governor has principles for clean energy. And within his principles for clean energy, there is a lot of diversity and inclusion components to it. So we're really excited about those. Um, one example is incentivize renewable energy develops to contract with diverse suppliers. Uh, it also incentivizes energy developers to diversify their corporate teams and set bold goals for diversity in ownership. And it also requires renewable energy developers to do business in our state to report on their diversity efforts. So I love that these principles have diversity and inclusion initiatives and um, I hope this has been helpful and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Oliva, and thank you so much for your leadership at the national level and in Illinois. I'm uh, proud to, to partner with you uh, now and in the future as we try to talk about more supplier and workforce diversity throughout the industry and throughout the nation. So thank you for joining us. We're going to transition now to our next panel which is Arizona Hispanic Education Pathway from K through 12 to university. Uh, we've got some great folks on our uh, panel here and we'll start uh, with K through 12 and then work our way up to the university. So we have David Adame, who is the president and CEO of Chicanos por la Causa here in Arizona. David, if you could please unmute and turn on your video. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that invite to be part of this. And I'm gonna take a, a different, uh, perspective, still keeping within the topic, but uh, I'm going to take it from a perspective of what's my wish list, what, what, what I wish was happening out there, because I work, I lead a, a, one of the largest nonprofits in the country, serving 600,000 plus people every day, and the challenge, first of all, um, I, I see the chancellor is going to be talking after me and others at the University of Arizona, is unfortunately, one of the disadvantages we have in the state of Arizona is that we're one of the bottom three when it comes to per student investment. So we're already starting way behind when it comes to preparing the future workforce of not only our state, but of this country. And because I also have the, the opportunity to serve on numerous economic councils in the state, this, this is a big challenge that's coming up for us because one of the biggest questions that we get from companies we're trying to recruit into the market, you know, taxes of course is always a, an important subject and schools and and things like that but it's also prepared workforce you know we i had an experience uh, uh helping uh recruit a company from canada to come into tucson uh, they were looking for engineers and could only find half of the amount they needed and they had to go and recruit uh additional engineers from mexico mexico city area nothing wrong with that in my book but we have such opportunity here in our own state to educate our own workforce, our own students, especially Hispanic students. And you mentioned we're 35% of the state. I think that's the official number. We're probably more than that unofficially, but uh, you know, we, that's the opportunity. So I, I would like to see more uh, working in partnership with the energy community 
Uh, and I love the resolution stuff. That was fantastic news that we heard from the commissioner from Illinois. But more stuff around uh, working with policy in the state, not only to deal with energy issues, because you know we've been involved with that as an organization as well, uh, but also around education policy and doing that. I like to also see, uh, I, I like the DOE has the internships, but how do we get more internships specifically from the industry, right? The different players in the whole supply chain of that. How do we get more opportunities for, for our students? So the other perspective we have is that we're a, a nonprofit that actually has for-profit subsidiaries. And one of the subsidiaries is a uh, design and coordination uh, utility design, dry utility engineering company. And our, we ourselves, you know, we're very fortunate that the local utilities like Arizona Public Service and Salt River Project and Southwest Gas has helped us get our start. And, and we've been, we went through all their programs for diversity inclusion, which is great. But when it comes to the workforce, now we're gonna create our own workforce. We also do as, an, as a nonprofit, do our own workforce. And we'll partner with Maricopa Community Colleges. You know, the chancellor is gonna speak here in a minute. But you know, starting with the high school students and giving them opportunities to get exposed to the industry, like doing drafting or learning how to use the CAD or, or things like that. Those are real, real life uh, opportunities that gives these students more exposure and understanding of what the opportunities are uh, in this industry. I'd also like to see more uh, investment for whether it's DOE and working with uh, SBA or, or any other federal department to provide more access to capital for more minorities can be entrepreneurs. There's a lot of great talent out there now. And if we had more minority of people of color led uh, organizations, of course, that's gonna help by recruiting uh, more people of color in, into the industry. And so those are things that I, I really would like to see. We know that there's a, we, doing our workforce work, we're competing against other industries. You know, we, we've talked to the airlines about the shortage of pilots. You know, we've talked to the construction industry. We've talked to everybody's short. And so we're gonna have to do something uh, very innovative, be very committed to bring the, the, the appropriate resources and infrastructure from internships to policy to uh, access to capital in order to make sure that we're gonna do this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there to make sure we have enough time, but I'll answer any more questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, David, for joining us. Really appreciate your perspective. Um, we'll move on now to uh, Chancellor Stephen Gonzalez, who's the Chancellor of Maricopa Community College. Uh, Stephen, if you could unmute and turn on your video, please. All right, I've unmuted and um, I don't know if you can see me yet. All right, there we go. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with everybody this afternoon and, and this evening for some of you, depending on where you're located nationally. Uh, my name is Stephen Gonzalez. I'm serving as the interim chancellor for the Maricopa Community College District, which is one of the largest uh, community college systems in the country. We, we serve approximately 200,000 students annually. Uh, we're comprised of 10 independently accredited colleges. Seven of our colleges out of the 10 are Hispanic serving institutions that are fed federally designated as such, which means that more than 25% of the students on campus must self-identify as being Hispanic. Um, in, you know, in, in hearing uh, some of the, the issues and concerns and uh, some of the things that people are focused and work is working on, I think um, as my, my good friend and colleague, uh, uh, David Adami just said, uh, there's, there's steep competition um, for our students in the workforce. Um, in addition to the, some of the ones that he mentioned, uh, we've got you know uh, the, 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 the silverness that's occurring in, in machining, for example, and in just some of the other areas where there is big need for um, our students. Now, one of the ways that we are taking advantage of the fact that several of our colleges are Hispanic serving institutions is their ability to apply for federal grants by way of either Title V or specifically HSI uh, STEM grants. And we've been successful in those. Those typically will have a, a focus um, even within the STEM industry of, of the types of students that we're trying to, to meet and serve. If you're not aware, um, Maricopa does have a few programs that feed directly into the energy field. Um, these are more in the area of, of installation and transmission of air energy and maintenance of, of, of energy uh, production. Uh, we work with um, 
our energy partners in the district. We, we have a, a partnership out in Estrella Mountain Community College with Palo Verde Nuclear Plant, for example. Um, so, so we're doing some things on that middle skill level, but I think what we have to help overcome is this image of what, what perhaps uh, students have there in the K-12 pipeline and perhaps what their parents have when they, when they think if, if their child comes home and says, I think I want to uh, work for SRP or I think I want to work for EPS or I think I want to work for Palo Verde or one of the co-ops, um, that there's probably an image that's painted and perhaps they think of the only opportunity is their son or daughter um, extending line from one pole to another. And we know that there's so much more than that. And so I think what we've got to do is come together and, and, and really um, identify what those opportunities are within, those, within this industry. Um, on the educational end of this, research has shown is that when, when students see um, instructors, and in our case, professors that resemble them, they, they will tend to be more successful. We, we will retain them and uh, we will graduate more of them. Well, we can translate that research and data into the, the prospect of um, taking Hispanics in this particular case that are already in the energy field and bringing them into our classrooms, bringing them into our organizations, bringing them onto our campuses so that students that may be developing an interest or maybe don't know anything about what's available in the energy field will see um, successful professionals that, are, that at least look like them. And that might be enough to spark the interest. So I'd be really interested in partnering with our, our, uh, our, our energy manufacturers in, in the state of Arizona to do more of that. So um, again, I, I, I wanna make sure that we have time for everybody else. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here and present and to share with you some of the things that the Maricopa Community College District is working on. Thank you so much, Stephen. And I wanna remind people if they have questions, they can put it in the chat and we'll tackle those at the end of our panel, but appreciate your perspective. Uh, we'll hear now from Dean David Hahn of College of Engineering at the University of Arizona. Um, I understand the Dean has been there since I think July of 2019. Um, David, if you could please unmute and turn on your video. Excellent, well, thank you. Uh, I certainly wanna thank Commissioner Leah Marquez-Peterson and HIE's Jose Perez for their invitation. It's really great to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm meeting some new people um, just let me quickly introduce myself. I am Dean of the College of Engineering at the University of Arizona. And as uh, Commissioner Peterson just said, I arrived in summer of 2019 after spending more than 20 years at the University of Florida. I'm a mechanical engineer. And personally, I've had some of my own research interests over my career around energy. In particular, at Florida, I worked with DOE Sunshot and RPE programs around storage of solar energy. So I'm a big proponent of energy, and I'm also a big proponent of the role of STEM. So um, it's great to be a part of this. You know, just as important as energy, if I can say that to this group, is the expansion of the STEM pipeline, in particular, the expansion of the STEM pipeline to grow our number of underrepresented persons. You know, this forum is specifically addressing the recruitment of Hispanic students into STEM fields so we can move these future engineers into our education programs, then move them into the energy related workforce and to Jose's goal to ultimately move them into the C-suite. We have to move that CEO number off of seven. So I'm, I'm with you on that. You know, it's been long established through study after study that diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams by a lot. So, you know, just from a purely business decision perspective, we want our teams of engineers to reflect the diversity of our community, knowing very well that such teams will be more productive and more innovative and therefore positively impact our bottom line. That's an established fact. In addition, you know, we worry very much about the STEM pipeline in general. I've spent a lot of time with senior executives of large companies, energy sector, aerospace sector. And you know, they often say my number one concern that keeps me up at night is worrying about attracting the engineering workforce to meet our needs over the next decade or more. Um, you know, just as Ann Augustine just stated, we, we just can't fill the positions needed if we're excluding large portions of society in our engineering workforce pipeline. As Jose noted, 18% of our nation is Hispanic. And as we learned a few moments ago, 45% of our K-12 system in Arizona is Hispanic. We have to include these people in our workforce. You know, in Florida and now in Arizona, 
we look strongly to our Hispanic students to fill these needs. You know, here at the University of Florida, we're a land grant university, we're a Hispanic serving institute. So we're all about the accessibility to education and serving our entire community. So putting all this together, we need more Hispanic students coming into energy, focusing, and uh, we need to do this together. Let me just say a few quick words about the University of Arizona engineering and where we are going. You know, as a land grant university, as a flagship University of Arizona, as a member of the American Association of Universities, a very prestigious group, we should have probably 7,500 students in engineering on our campus. Our similarly ranked peer institutions, University of Florida um, does. So, you know, we're roughly half that size right now and then we should be. And that's one of the reasons I took this job. We have an opportunity to grow our college to what I call its rightful place and size. And I'm really pleased that at the University of Florida, I mean, University of Arizona now at Florida, University of Arizona, President Robbins is really behind our vision to grow and to expand that pipeline and include all of, of our citizens of the community. You know, as we grow our college across all fronts, it's a very multi-step process. It takes close coordination with our community colleges. So it's a pleasure to share the stage with Chancellor Gonzalez in particular. It takes K-12 outreach. It takes close cooperation with our recruiters, the companies out here, that's you today. And you know, challenges are many. It's getting the word out about education pathways. As we just heard about the empowerment of what an engineering degree can do to advance your economic and career pathways. It's providing financial support to those students and it's partnering with industry for internships and mentoring programs. So that's why I'm excited to be here today to talk about STEM education, to talk about the necessity for diversity in our pipeline to meet our needs and, and to be more innovative and to build bridges with the utility industry. You know, to let you know that we, the University of Arizona College of Engineering, we're here to work with you 100%. So I'm going to be quiet and get us back on track so uh, we can move on. Thank you very much again, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Dean. And, and I had a question for all three of you, actually, if you'd like to turn on your videos. Um, as you, I've been tracking the chat, and I don't know if you'd had a chance to look at it, but it's filled with these great examples of apprenticeship programs. Uh, scholarship programs and other things that are throughout the nation and even here in Arizona. Um, in doing my research prior to our forum, I found online that in Arizona, 12% of teachers are Hispanic. So I think it was uh, Stephen who spoke about role models. Um, and so certainly ideas I wrote down prior to this forum were, you know, certainly the role models, additional teachers, speakers, internships. Um, I, I think that's something that's so vital. Uh, at all three levels, K through 12, community college and university, what do you suggest? How do we do this? Um, we've got all three of our largest utilities watching right now. What suggestions do you have for, for increasing or bettering those numbers? Well, my, my, my feedback, uh, Commissioner, I, I put a couple of examples of partnerships that we have with, with a private university here in our market and also the U of A. Uh, they, they made a commitment uh, to work with us and the and the private sector to raise additional dollars where we can provide that access for that's not a barrier right that's the last thing we want is a a bright um, young uh, Hispanic student to be able to handle the workload and, and the STEM studies but then can't afford to go or, or, or can't afford to live on campus you know those first couple of years which is very critical the, the studies show that and right now unfortunately in our market we don't have uh, you know, they won't say it, my colleagues on the panel, but unfortunately today our state doesn't really, they've, they've been zeroed out of the budgets pretty much. And we need the private sector to step up to help us with this, this situation. Uh, I think there's some creative ways that we can do it and structure it in a way that it's sustainable, right? Not looking for just donations all the time. I think there's different ways that if we had a chance to sit down and do a whiteboard session with more time, we could figure out creative ways in order to support the system and make sure that we are providing this opportunity to to help everybody because we all need the workforce. Excellent. Uh, and I'll just join in. You know, it, it definitely it takes a, a, a commitment from K through PhD, right? We have to bring more students into the pipeline on the front end, but then we have to do a better job on the back end of nurturing these graduates and bring them in, into to our education. We just started with the Pac-12 deans of engineering. We just actually made plans to start a a concerted effort to nurture and mentor PhD students and um, 
and uh, postdocs that are underrepresented, women, Hispanic, African-American, to help bring them into the faculty ranks. Because as, as uh, um, um, Stephen just said a moment ago, you know, the students have to see people that reflect themselves, right? And that's a huge part of success and retention of students. Um, you know, the University of Arizona is, is making great strides. You know, my boss, the provost, Liesl, is a female engineer. Our new VP for research is a female engineer. Um, so they're putting resources actually to help us recruit specifically and diversify our, our, our faculty ranks. So we're making progress on that, but we have a long way to go. Thank you. And Stephen, would you like to speak to it? Absolutely. Um, I, I would agree with what my colleagues have said and on what we can do to uh, improve the presence and nurturing of, of more students of color, particularly Hispanics, since that's our topic today in, into these sort of fields. Um, let me just share something else with you guys in terms of research. By the fifth grade, um, students know whether their, their family support structure can afford to send them to college. There's something that, that they see in the household that, that just lets them know that. So that means that we've got we've to begin this fight earlier, not only to convince them that they need to go to college, but to be there to show how we can support that. As, as David um, said, it's critically important that we provide that support early on. Now, of the 35% of the students in, in Maricopa that are Hispanic, I would venture to guess that at least three fourths of those are first generation students. And this is where it becomes extremely important to have a partnership with our, our professional industries that our students will go into because they're first generation students and they're also first generation professionals. That means that there's likely not anyone in the home that they come home to that they can sit down and talk about the fact that perhaps they've got a meeting with some senators or they've got a meeting with some commissioners that they're meeting with other policymakers. And, uh, you know, there's, there, if there isn't anyone at home to help you strategize in that, then it's incumbent upon us as professionals in the field already to, to keep that in mind. We somehow think that once they get that degree and they get that job, that they're set and they're ready to just go and they're going to flourish. The, the nurturing and the mentoring has to continue as first generation professionals. And I'm saying that because I'm a first generation professional and I've, I've had to learn the hard way and, and I've also had to learn um, through through many people that have decided to mentor me. And I've also mustered up the courage to actually ask people to mentor me. That's some great advice. Thank you, Stephen. And, and I'll, I'll point out too, as a former Hispanic chamber president here in Arizona, some of the tactical ways I think it works to build role models and speakers, it's really at that classroom level as deans and as chancellors and as presidents, if you can build programs, it's very helpful. But I would often get calls from an employee resource group. So they have those in the large companies. So for those that work in the utility industry, whether it's African-American, Hispanic, women, employee resource groups, we would connect with them. We would find small business owners, in our case that were Hispanic or Latino, and feed them into different classrooms, K through 12, all the way up through university. So adopting a school, connecting with an employee resource group, talking to your local uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I think all of those are ideas to actually get this done tomorrow before an entire program's built. I think we can actually move the needle. But thank you, gentlemen, for uh, speaking on the education panel. And please stay on to hear from our utilities uh, as we move on to the next panel. Um, and so at this point, we're going to move to our Workforce and STEM Electric Utility Panel. Very excited to have both Tucson Electric Power UNS, Salt River Project, and APS joining us here today. They've been online listening to the different ideas uh, and opportunities that have been brought up uh, and hopefully have had a chance to look at the chat too, which has a lot of great ideas in it. We'll go ahead and start with uh, Kathy Reese, who's the Vice President of Customer and Human Resources at Tucson Electric Power UNS. Kathy. Thank you so much, Commissioner Peterson. So, um, Anita, why don't we uh, go ahead and start with our first slide. Welcome, everyone. And this has been a great discussion so far. Can we see the first slide? Hopefully, she's pulling that up. Let's see. Yep. So, I just um, wanted I to... Got a... Go ahead. Hi, Kathy. Can you hear me? I got an email saying that you weren't having any slides today. I'm sorry, I meant to, I did send them to you. So why don't I go ahead? Am okay. I able to pull them up? I'll... 
Sorry for that. Did you? Okay, can you share your screen, Kathy? I can, I'm gonna share it right now. See if that works. So I just need her to enable me to do that. But Anita, I, I sent them to you last night, so. Anyway, I'll go ahead. I think I hear Anita looking for them. I'm not able to share my uh, screen. So I think what I'll do is I'll just start by orienting people to who TEP is. We are uh, one of the third, we are the third largest utility in the state of Arizona. We have over uh, 2000 employees. And I like to say that we are spread throughout the uh, state of Arizona, not in Maricopa County, which is where APS and SRP are located. Um, uh, so we're kind of the perimeter and then heavily concentrated in Southern uh, Arizona as well. So our vision is to be an exceptional energy provider. Uh, we just refreshed that vision um, that positively impacts the lives of our employees, our customers, as well as our community. And while we love that vision, we're more proud of how we got there, which is engaging our employees in focus groups and working groups to ensure that um, they were uh, part of it and it is actually their voice that is coming through with the vision. We're actually doing the same thing and Anita, I'm on slide four. We're actually doing the same thing uh, with our uh, refreshing our values. And as we refresh our values, uh, we're going through that same process and we will include a diversity, equity and inclusion component in those values. We also are large in the community in terms of support, uh, especially this year, uh, adding some additional support for COVID and uh, beginning to get very involved in DE&I um, for in the uh, community, as well as industry um, groups that are starting to uh, be deployed throughout uh, the United States. You can go ahead and go to slide four if you would. So uh, we're on the uh, slide that talks about our employee life cycle. And so what we do is the top one is pipeline uh, planning. And I'm gonna come back to that because I'd really like to spend the most time talking about that. That's the focus of today's discussion. And in the chat, we have been paying attention to everything available in the chat, which we will definitely be following up with some of you uh, in this panel. But we apply DEI strategy to everything that we do relative to our employee life cycle. Um, we talk about developing our employees. We have a DEI lens um, and include DEI courses in all of our employee developments. When we value, we're talking about how do we compensate our employees with competitive programs. But more than that, how do we take into account uh, compensation decisions and career advancement decisions? Um, in a equitable way. And we talk about unconscious bias each and every time we have those conversations. And we also include a uh, panel of a cross-functional panel that uh, hold calibrated uh, sessions to make sure that we have many voices coming into uh, an employee's experience here at TEP. And then Energize, you know, we're looking for ways to better listen to the voice of our employees. And with that, especially when it comes to DEI, and so uh, in 2021, we were actually going to roll it out this year, but we've been delayed by the pandemic. We we're going to roll out our uh, and it, our Gallup survey uh, that also includes additional DEI questions, uh, specifically targeted at understanding uh, the voice of our customer of our uh, employees. We um, are also maturing our approach towards our data uh, relative to diversity, and we will be uh, publishing that sometime in 2021. And uh, we hold town halls, listening sessions, um, and participate in industry uh, surveys. We could go to the next slide. I'd really like to spend the next uh, couple of minutes on this slide as well as the slide after this one. So of our uh, almost 2,100 employees across the state of Arizona, about 30%, 37%, excuse me, uh, are minorities. And of the 
leaders in our organization, about 27% were minorities. So we have a pretty low turnover rate uh, relative to other industries. So just to give you an example, in my last company, which was manufacturing, we had about a 30 to 40% turnover rate. Here at UNS Energy, we have about a 7% turnover rate. So we recognize that things won't happen overnight. Change isn't gonna happen overnight. And so that's where we really wanna focus on our talent pipeline. So our pipeline uh, initiatives are centered around engaging and attracting, attracting a diverse workforce. And most of them are specifically geared towards engaging Hispanic students. I, I mentioned that we were uh, heavily concentrated in Southern Arizona, even though we are throughout the state of Arizona. Uh, we do focus on his uh, programs and schools that are largely Hispanic. We also uh, start young. So we start in grade school, we go all the way through postgraduate. The CEWD tells us that kids make up their mind about how smart they are by third grade. That's why we start so young. One program that I'm really proud of that we've been partnering with them uh, for the last 14 years is San Miguel uh, High School. So this is a program that empowers the students there and engages them in a court, uh, it's an internship program. Um, they partner with corporations throughout Southern Arizona. We uh, have sponsored over a hundred students, a hundred uh, San Miguel high school students, uh, anywhere from their freshman year all the way through their senior year. And oftentimes uh, we'll get them all four years. Most of the time we get them all four years. And then we get the satisfaction of seeing them graduate from high school and go on to college. So one of the reasons why we love this program is that they have a hundred percent graduation rate and in an area of town that only touts about a 50% graduation rate. And then of those uh, students that do graduate, 98% who have applied for college uh, are accepted. So great, great numbers. We also uh, have a significant outreach into Sunnyside School District where the student population is about 96% who's uh, Hispanic. We have, um, career days, we, part, we do partner in all of their different career days and events that they have. Uh, Pima Community College also, uh, we host uh, something called Careers in Energy in Pima Community College. We also, uh, partnering with Pima, um, have an industry tech program, which is a program that is intended to give students a leg up into the uh, utility industry uh, and, and also to get them interested in the utility industry where we do have great jobs. Nita, if you could go to the next slide. So we also understand the importance of investing in our community as well as uh, to make sure that our industry has a skilled workforce. We heard a lot about how other industries come into town, they wanna relocate here. And the first thing they ask about is the availability of talent. So a program that uh, we have been involved in since 2017 is a partnership with Davis Monthan, where we support a six month internship for uh, uh, individuals who are either uh, careering out or retiring from the military. This is an awesome program. This program allows them to get to know us. They get to rotate in areas that they're interested in. And it also gives us good chance uh, to get to know them, it's, we call it. We like to call it the world's lo uh, longest job interview. It's a great program. Julie Bracamonte is our recruiter, who's been instrumental in standing this up at our utility, and she's also been invited to other utilities to help stand up this program or a program like it with their partnering uh, military bases at other uh, utilities, actually uh, even outside the state of Arizona. Um, we also, uh, and the military interns are, um, uh, let's see, they're largely uh, Hispanic. Most of them are minorities and largely Hispanic, and they are really talented individuals. We also work closely with the universities. Um, we bring in anywhere between 60 and 100 interns every year. Uh, we get them for either two to three years, and in that program, uh, specifically this past year, about 40% of those interns um, are Hispanic. 
So they, we look at those programs as really the key uh, to our pipeline, um, which is where we invest a lot of our uh, focus. We provide them with all kinds of uh, inroads into our organization, learning about not just the area that they're interning in, but um, all areas about uh, the electric utility business, as well as the gas, if they're up north. The next program, or next slide, please, Anita. Um, the other way that we make sure that we're investing in our employees is to make sure that we are uh, providing the right level of education opportunities for them. And so we redesigned our employee investment program, our tuition reimbursement program, to make it simpler and easier for uh, our employees to go back and get their degrees. And this was a Facebook post that one of our employees put on their mortar board, which we just I actually love that picture. So uh, we, since we've made those changes, we've seen a huge, huge increase in the number of uh, employees going back to get their uh, degree. Next slide, please. So our culture, we talked a little bit about the uh, Gallup survey in terms of adding additional DEI uh, questions. Uh, on the left, there's a sample of uh, thriving together micro learning uh, that we started to put out during this pandemic as a way to keep our employees engaged. It's a daily uh, email that goes out and there's a different topic every day, Monday through Friday. And so either Thursday or Friday included in those micro learnings is always a, a conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you can see Gabrielle uh, Camacho on the, on the, in that particular newsletter right there. We also started a mini shades series. So this was following a listening tour uh, that we did across the organization that leaders, starting with our uh, chairman of our board of directors, uh, who is pictured in the story on the right, uh, through our CEO president and many VPs uh, participated in these listening tours where it was a safe place for people to talk about, you know, their feelings um, with the civil unrest that we were experiencing at that time. So it was uh, powerful, it was meaningful, and it helped us shape uh, what we're focusing on uh, moving forward. And so Mini Shade series came out of that as an opportunity for people to talk about their own uh, experiences where they experience maybe bias, prejudice, or even racism. And then last slide. So we look at our focus on DEI as well as our talent as a tapestry. I guess we'll call it a tapestry of initiatives. Uh, our, we are focusing on initiatives throughout the organization and it's multi-pronged. So we know that we are all in, we are absolutely committed and we are going to continue to do everything that we can to move forward in our path uh, in DEI. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Commissioner Peterson. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. That excellent presentation. And um, I know Tucson Electric Power is in Tucson, obviously, for those on the call. And we're a community of about a million people. And you're one of the largest employers, I would imagine. I don't know the ranking, but it's just so... Great to see the investment you have in supplier di or, uh, workforce diversity. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna move on to Essen Otu, who is the manager of diversity and inclusion at Salt River Project. Uh, Essen, if you could please uh, turn on your video and, and, and uh, unmute yourself. Absolutely, hopefully you can, everyone can see and hear me. Um, I have some slides as well. So hopefully Anita is in the process of pulling those up. But um, I want to thank, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here with, with you today. Um, and I'm just happy to be here to, to uh, share some of what SRP or Salt River Project is doing to um, enhance our workforce diversity and STEM uh, career opportunities. And so if you don't know Salt River Project, we're one of the nation's uh, largest public power utilities and uh, we actually provide uh, water and power to about 2 million customers uh, and employ about 5,300 employees. Um, I started in uh, March of this year 
as the uh, manager for diversity and inclusion at SRP. And what I can tell you is that there's been um, just amazing momentum around DNI at SRP that, um, you know, we've adopted uh, core values around diversity, inclusion, and belonging that are very visible and that we're really beginning to weave throughout our organization. I hope to show uh, and share a few of those examples. And I'll tell you that my goal is really um, to accelerate the impact of DNI at SRP, um, to really position us as a DNI leader in the utility industry. Um, but ultimately, we want to um, build a more equitable and sustainable uh, future for our, our customers, our, um, our employees, and our community. And so, uh, like many organizations, we um, you know, we're working towards addressing uh, workforce representation. We want to mirror uh, the community and the customers that we're serving, um, including the, the percentage of SRP employees uh, that identify as Hispanic or Latino uh, when compared to uh, the county and state uh, census data, right? And so we've, we've got a ways to go, uh, admittedly, uh, to see that representation, but um, at all levels of our organizations, but, but are actively working on it. Um, and so we're doing everything from uh, setting workforce representation targets to expanding our recruitment pools and deepening our candidate pipelines, uh, applying bias mitigation to, um, to every point in our employee life cycle, as, as Kathy talked about, and really um, thinking about the, the long-term future and sustainability of SRP in relation to diversity and inclusion. So the, the a picture you see here, and kind of let me, let me just start by highlighting um, one of our amazing employees. Picture you see here is of uh, Zamantha. Zamantha is a senior uh, engineer in the engineering drafting and design group uh, at SRP. And among many things, uh, Zamantha sits on the board for uh, the Aguila Youth Leadership Institute. And it's actually a program that she graduated from uh, while in high school. And she um, often goes back, speaks to um, Aguila students at their sessions about STEM career opportunities uh, because she's experienced that firsthand, right? Um, and knows the importance of exposure. And I'm a strong believer in kind of the power of proximity, right? You don't know what you don't know and you don't, uh, don't know how to engage in a career you've never been exposed to. Um, and so we want to be able to develop, um, you know, first of all, attract, right, develop and um, elevate uh, more Zamanthas in the future by, uh, you know, being visible and providing exposure to our young people. And how do we do that? Uh, I'll share a few quick examples of um, what actions we're taking to ensure that that workforce pipeline uh, and exposure, exposure really better reflects uh, the customers and communities that we serve. Next slide, please. Um, so I, our community outreach department uh, has done an amazing job of establishing uh, just many deep and meaningful relationships in the community. Uh, including the one I just mentioned with Aguila Youth, Youth Leadership Institute, but um, you know many Hispanic and Latino uh, organizations have played a pretty significant role in um, um, you know putting forth SRP as a potential employer. So what you see here is an example of those. I'll share that uh, besides Aguila, which I mentioned before, <clears throat> organizations like the Be a Leader Foundation, uh, you know. We, we really partner with to support uh, things like their career shadow week by having students visit uh, SRP to learn about careers in the industry. And so these, uh, these deep partnerships in the community with some of these organizations that work with young people allow us to uh, and enable us to do that. Next slide. So we also work with all of our um, our state universities. And one example of uh, our work to increase diversity in the STEM um, field is our research collaboration with Northern, Northern Arizona University or NAU, um, where we um, 
it's a five-year partnership and that's allowing researchers and, and student researchers to look at solutions uh, to specific questions facing uh, that region of our state in northern Arizona and really is creating another avenue for developing diverse pipelines. Um, another, another one I'll mention is um, a partnership with uh, Grand Canyon University where we have a cybersecurity recruitment program that's also attached to our Maricopa Community Colleges which, which uh, Dr. Gonzalez mentioned earlier. And so really connecting our community college system <clears throat> to our state universities and thinking about how we can create uh, programs and partnerships that, that fuel that pipeline has been um, really important to SRP. Next slide. And then it was mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things that we're really proud of at SRP are our employee resource groups. There are 10 of them. Um, and, you know, they really do serve as a resource to our employees and to the organization as a whole. And Ablamos SRP uh, is one of our most active um, employee resource groups. So just wanted to highlight and, and just share a little bit about them briefly in the next slide. So, um, Ablamos has been in place since 2006. There are about 230 members, um, and their mission is really to create opportunities for growth, uh, community involvement, and to support a more uh, culturally uh, diverse workforce. And uh, what you see here um, are some of their accomplishments. <clears throat> Do a lot of fundraising in the community. In this particular uh, picture here, uh, you can see that they uh, donated last year $10,000 to the Sisu Cueta Foundation. Um, and what you don't see here is that we often go to our employee resource groups, and particularly Ablamos, um, to really get, use them as a sounding board, right, for communications, marketing, d &I ideas, and to really uh, leverage their insights, perspective, and lived experience. Um, and so I wanted to take some time to just highlight them. And as I go into the last slide here, um, I'll end with a bit of an ask. And um, you can go on the next slide. And that ask is really for your partnership in, in helping SRP ensure that we're working towards and continue to work towards attracting the highly um, qualified and diverse talent that we know is out there. Um, we've got opportunities for uh, annually for 120 to 130 uh, paid internship opportunities to amazing long-term career opportunities in, in so many areas. And so our, our DNI team um, and community out, outreach teams would love to build uh, relationships with, uh, with you. So please feel free to reach out to us at this email, diversityinclusion at srp.com. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you today. Thank you, Essen. Some great ideas. I was taking lots of notes there. Very interesting. Uh, and we'll move on now to Ann Becker. She's the Vice President of Environmental and, and the Chief Sustainability Officer at APS. Ann. Thank you so much, Commissioner Marquez Peterson. Um, and thank you for the invitation. It really is um, an honor to be here with all of you talking about um, an issue that's very near and dear to our heart at APS, and that is diversity and inclusion. Uh, my name is Ann Becker. I am the Vice President of Sustainability with APS. I've been with the company for about 20 years, and most recently um, helped to stand up a brand new department at APS called Sustainability. So we've got a group of employees now who are dedicated full-time to focusing on sustainability and ESG. ESG meaning environmental stewardship, social responsibility, and, and strong corporate governance. Um, social responsibility, from our perspective, really has taken on significant new meaning since COVID hit. Um, we've seen a lot of renewed focus by investors and stakeholders um, on how companies are taking care of and treating their employees. And so we have a new, renewed focus uh, on social responsibility within APS and are looking at how do we make sure that we are doing the right thing by all of our stakeholders. And our, our stakeholders include obviously our customers, um, our shareholders, uh, our communities, but also our employees and perhaps even especially our employees because they are the ones at the end of the day who make it all happen and they are the ones who keep the lights on 
uh, for our customers in Arizona. So our perspective is that DEI falls squarely within a company's social responsibility. Inclusion at APS, we think about inclusion um, as a verb. Include is a verb to include. Um, and inclusion at APS is a deliberate action on the part of all of our colleagues to em really embrace the unique perspectives of everyone that we work with and to also foster a collaborative working environment where all of our employees can thrive. We know and we've heard a lot today about how important diversity and inclusion are to achieving our respective goals. Um, and so we are, we are really focused on how we can um, enhance inclusion at APS. What does it mean? What does good look like in practice? So we've got 6,200 employees at APS, uh, many of whom have been here a long time. We've got an average tenure of about 12 years. Um, about 17% of our workforce is Hispanic. And I will tell you, I don't think that's good enough. Um, our state is 31% Hispanic. And as Essen articulated, our goal is for our workforce to really reflect and look like our customer base. So we know we've got some work to do in that space. Um, about 11% of our total leader um, population, we've got about 1,000 total leaders and 11% of those are Hispanic. A couple of things that we have observed in regards to our Hispanic workforce, we've got fewer Hispanics in operations and we need to work on that. Um, the same really is true with all of our diverse populations. We see more women and more ethnic minorities um, in support positions rather than in operations. And we've got a focus on helping to turn that ship around a little bit. It's very important that we've got strong diversity um, in our operations um, areas as well. We also have observed through um, our annual uh, employee engagement survey that our Hispanic employee population tends to be pretty highly engaged, um, which is really refreshing to see, uh, more highly engaged than some of our other populations. 44% of our external hires last year were diverse ethnically or in gender, um, and the number of Hispanic employees that we have continues to rise year over year. So we are pleased with that, but we know we've got more work to do. Why does DE and I matter? Well, we've spent a lot of time talking about that today. And I think we all fundamentally understand that DE and I is good for business. Um, I, I wanna say we call it DEI and B. We talk about at APS, we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, and I think Essen mentioned that as well. That really is the evolution of diversity from our perspective is to a space of belonging where our employees feel like they are engaged, they are motivated and they are in the right spot. Um, so we know that, that diversity and inclusion benefits our employees. It makes job stability, job fulfillment, job opportunities more accessible to more people but it also benefits the company. We know we get better decisions when we've got diverse perspectives at the table because we can leverage the experiences and the insights of our employees who come from widely diverse backgrounds. Um, we have better employee experiences. Um, focusing on inclusion we know really creates a more optimal work environment for our employees where they can feel a sense of belonging and an equal, equal opportunity for development and advancement. Um, and we also see better performance. When our employees feel like they belong, they perform better. And that frankly just makes sense. Um, like SRP and TEP, we have, um, we've got a lot of initiatives to focus on and increase our population of Hispanic employees. And it all starts with pipeline. And we've heard a lot about that today. Um, Hispanics are graduating in higher rates from Arizona U uh, universities than all other demographics. And I believe currently represent about 50% of the K through 12 education system. So this is uh, a really critical pool for our talent recruitment. We partner with a number of student organizations, the Hispanic Business Student Organization, the Society of Hispanic professional engineers. We also have a number of programs that are specifically targeted to recruiting diverse and specifically Hispanic employees. We have partnered with Chicanos por la Casa to recruit Hispanic 
customer service advisors. Um, and this is a program that's been very successful. We've had two classes and a total of 17 new employees join us directly from CPLC and from this program. Um, and our call center leaders have commented to us about this partnership. They appreciate it so much. They say that our partnership with CPLC and these new employees have been a breath of fresh air. Um, and that the quality of the candidates that have sought us out through our partnership with CPLC has been phenomenal. So we really appreciate CPLC's investment in this partnership. We also have a lineman scholarship program that is specifically targeted to diverse candidates. We launched this program in April of last year in partnership with Friendly House and a couple of other uh, organizations, CPLC, the NAACP, um, and received a number of applications from around the state and we awarded need-based scholarships to the top candidates. Um, and this program has been incredibly successful as well and we'll be continuing it for a second class of candidates early next year. Um, one of my colleagues, Miguel Bravo, who I think is listening in right now, hi Miguel, um, has been intimately involved with our lineman scholarship program and has gotten to know the candidates. And, and the piece of feedback he fed me that I love is, he said, these are quality people and a few of them have had to work through some really serious adversity to complete the program and achieve their goals. And for me, it's incredibly inspiring to know that we've got this partnership that is really allowing um, some future APS employees to overcome that adversity um, and to achieve their goals. And so it's been, it's been really invigorating for us to see the success of that program. We also have uh, training programs that are focused on DNI. All employees are required to take um, a DNI training module during their onboarding. And then we have regular refreshes of that. We also have a couple of leadership academies at APS that are focused on um, high potential individual con contributors and frontline leaders. We also like SRP have a very active and very engaged employee networking group called OLA, the Hispanic Organization for Leadership and Advancement. And that is uh, an employee networking group that thrives. Um, it is one of our most active and engaged networking group and it provides a lot of professional development and resources for our Hispanic employees. Another thing that we did as a leadership team um, in light of Black Lives Matter and the events that we witnessed over the summer was we are in the middle of hosting a series of officer listening sessions with our groups of diverse employees to understand and hear their experiences. We want to hear firsthand what their experiences have been like working at APS so that we can understand better and more collaboratively work to advance inclusion. I am, um, I'm not the sponsor of OLA. I am the executive sponsor of our LGBT Alliance networking group. And I participated in that listening session and I'll share with you, it was incredibly compelling to listen to the stories, the very candid and frankly vulnerable um, stories that our employees shared with us around what it is like to be a diverse employee at APS. And our intent is to take all of that feedback and really hone our inclusion programs better. We also have a program um, that I think is uh, really um, an amazing program. It's been around since 1997 and it's, we call it D-STEP. It stands for Diverse Supplier Training Program. Um, and I suspect that Julie West, who is our Chief Procurement Officer, talked about this program brief, the first um, session that you had. We've had this D-STEP program in place since 1997, and we bring in small and diverse business owners, local, uh, local small, diverse business owners. And we teach them how to do business with APS, how to do things like respond to an RFP, how to develop a strategic business plan. Um, and it is an intensive program with a serious time commitment. There's 140 hours of classroom time. And we have held 22 classes of participants through DSTEP and have really found that it has um, done a great job preparing the participants um, to do business with us. And we have uh, been doing business with a lot of the graduates of that program. So that's a program that I'm really proud of and that has been a, real, a really successful partnership. From a governance perspective um, at APS, we recently stood up a reformed inclusion council. It used to be the diversity council and now it is the inclusion council with a renewed focus on what best practices look like um, and how can we 
effectively respond to the feedback that we are hearing from our diverse employees. We also have a dedicated DEI manager and team, um, and we are really excited about the work that they're doing. Um, and then finally, I will say uh, our, our diverse spend with Hispanic businesses has been significant as well. In 2019, we spent $20 million with uh, Hispanic businesses. Our total diverse spend is, um, is more than that, and we need to continue to look for opportunities to partner with the Hispanic community. We know that the Hispanic spending power in Arizona is tremendous, um, and it's an opportunity for us to really double down on those partnerships. So I will just close by saying that we know at APS that inclusion, it's not just the right thing to do, it's also the profitable and the sustainable thing to do. It's good for business. Inclusion is a growth strategy um, that we have extended throughout our organization. And, and we framed it not just as our responsibility, but really a business and growth strategy. Um, Hispanics, we know, are our customer base right now and our future customer base. Um, and, uh, and so I just, I wanna say thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you. Um, and thank you to Commissioner Marquez Peterson for organizing this event. This is such an important topic for those of us in Arizona here. And uh, I just wanna say thank you for organizing today's event. And with that, I'll sign off. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you, Anne. Very, very interesting to hear all the work APS is doing. Um, let's see. We have one question in the chat, and I've got uh, some comments too. A question from Anthony Martinez, who says, as part of your respective ESG models of being engaged in sustainable initiatives, what types of economic development initiatives are at the forefront of reaching out to the Native American communities in Arizona? Yeah, that's a great question. And we, uh, we have a power plant on the Navajo Nation. And so we have had a longstanding um, and I think very successful partnership with the Navajo Nation. Um, and we are, uh, you know, we have partnered with them on a number of economic develop, uh, development initiatives. Um, we are working right now, we are having conversations right now with the Navajo Nation around what does it look like when our coal fired power plant for corners closes in 2031? How do we help um, do our part to ensure that the Navajo Nation is able to effectively transition from a coal-based economy to a, a, a different sustainable economy? And so, yes, we, we absolutely are engaged with, uh, with the Navajo Nation, and there are a number of other Native American communities with whom we do business and also work on economic development. Um, I certainly will stand down if Kathy or Essen want to, want to chime in there as well. Thanks, Anne. I think I would just add to that, um, that we have specific outreach efforts uh, in as part of our recruiting approach uh, to the various nations uh, and, uh, and folks that live there. So uh, they get a special outreach um, that, and it's focused and it's concentrated to um, help facilitate, you know, entrance into our organization, in addition to a little bit of what Anne is talking about with um, some of the plant closures that are going on around the state. Um, Commissioner, can I speak? I don't, I don't know if I'm appropriate to speak right now. It's Margie Morris from TEP. Oh, hi Margie. I think we were gonna have, uh, Essen, were you gonna make a comment? Well, I just was going to on that specific uh, note in that we have been working uh, re recently with the um, Native American tribes and engaging with them in their college programs and their trade programs for um, introduction into the energy industry. And we've spent a lot of time doing that and it's fruitful. So I just wanted to note that real quick. Okay, thank you, Margie. Thank you. And Essen, did you wanna to respond to that on, from SRP? Uh -huh. I was just going to mention uh, the, the NAU partnership that I mentioned earlier um, is one of the ways we're, we're thinking about the economic development and, and opportunities with, with our Native communities, uh, particularly up in northern Arizona. But, but um, you know, it was mentioned just plant closures. We've gone, we've gone through the closure of our uh, Navajo generating station, and, and uh, those are really challenging um, things to go through and transitioning uh, many of our employees down to the valley um, after that. 
So I think it's an opportunity for all of our utilities to, to consider um, just how do we continue to partner with and support our native communities throughout the state uh, as things evolve and change. Thank you. Uh, question also, uh, do each of the companies see opportunities to develop more initiatives with Chicanas for la Causa, community colleges, or the U of A in order to increase the number of Latinos going into energy STEM? If so, what would be some ways? Anne, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm happy to address that. Um, we've, you know, we've got some strong partnerships. I've, I've taken notes today as well, and I think we I think one of the things we need to do is these kinds of conversations more because we can learn a lot from each other. Um, I've taken notes on both what S and Kathy said. So I think there is a lot of opportunity out there. I think we've only started to tap the well, if you will. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that we can spend time together brainstorming how we can better engage or what other opportunities are, um, we're all in. Uh, so we look forward to the discussion. I would agree that um, the opportunities are, are endless, and I think uh, you've heard us all talk about our commitment to DEI, and I think as those, um, as those efforts continue to grow and, and expand, uh, so will the opportunities to partner and really consider new and creative ways to, to leverage uh, what already exists, right? For, to give you an example, in our, um, in our situation with our employee resource groups, we're really thinking about how to uh, further leverage uh, the fact that 20% of our employees are engaged with an ERG, right? And where do the opportunities to connect with uh, their networks, their uh, professional associations, the, uh, the universities that they're associated with within the state and outside of Arizona. So I think there are, uh, there are many, many opportunities there and, and we would also welcome uh, the partnership with, with any of the folks represented on the phone uh, to, to collectively move forward and, and really develop a strong pipeline into these STEM careers. Yeah, thank you, Essen and Anne. I, I would just echo what you said. Um, we have an opportunity to continue this discussion, at least amongst the utilities, much like what we're doing here in the pandemic where we all came together and we have weekly calls across the state of Arizona talking about how to deal with issues um, that are common to our various utilities with the pandemic, we too should keep up that cadence of communication on this topic. We've already, uh, David, while we do have a relationship with uh, CPLC, I think we can do a better job um, there in terms of outreach and connecting with you. Um, I also firmly believe in a lot of the various programs that we've co-owned and created with the community colleges. Um, we think that that is a step in the right direction that really gives um, individuals who may not be thinking about the utility industry as maybe the Google industry, um, that it really is and it's fascinating and it's complex and it's uh, fast changing. And so it's an awesome field to get into. And so we like to, give them sort of an introduction uh, to those programs by building these programs together with the community colleges. And so we firmly, we've had a number of them um, and firmly believe in, in those programs. Lastly, um, I didn't mention, but will now, we do look to our BRGs to help inform uh, steps that we take as an organization, but also uh, opportunities for outreach. And so they play a pretty critical part uh, in our, um, our outreach in terms of uh, building our pipeline, uh, especially in the uh, Hispanic community. So look forward to more work on that. Thank you to each of you. And I think in, in this point, we really just started the conversation on so many of these different ideas as we're all talked about taking notes and so on. Um, I know at the very beginning of this conversation, I think it was Commissioner Oliva who spoke about the silver tsunami. And I've heard it called other things as, our workforce ages and uh, we need to continue to plan to replace folks that are currently in the workforce. Uh, and then at the same time, we're seeing more than half, 45% at least of our K through 12 population in Arizona being Hispanic. So it's really about building that pipeline. Some of the ideas that I wrote down today, and I think uh, we'll have to follow up after this in terms of whiteboarding it, I think David Adame mentioned in his, in his conversation, but 
really the the 12% of teachers in Arizona that are Hispanic, the idea of role models and speakers, internships, I heard SRP mention 120 a year and in internships, 120 people a year, uh, apprenticeship programs, we saw quite a bit in uh, the chat. I think those are all great ideas as well as scholarship programs needed. We know unfortunately the community is also one of the lower socioeconomic populations. So what can we do to ensure that that's not the hurdle, that's not the reason people aren't going on to community college or on to four-year universities. Um, we also heard a lot about um, the employee resource groups. So I hope that the educational institutions, those that are on the call today, if they hadn't heard of those before, realize that these utility companies, as well as a lot of corporate America, have these employee resource groups. Great place to plug in, to find speakers, to connect and find folks that can talk about uh, job shadowing or what, what are the careers in utilities. I think Essen mentioned it's not just stringing the lines on the poles. There's so much more to those industries and how do we teach folks about that. Um, Essen also mentioned employees on boards. I'd hope that each utility has some kind of incentive or, or some kind of tracking program for their employees that are serving on boards in the community, because that's often the place you sit face to face with, you know, a utility company employee can ask, what, what do you do and how does this work and uh, how do I engage my own children in something like that as an example. Um, and then I saw on, I think it was one of SRP slides, an ASU Leadership Institute reference. I think that's a great idea. I don't know if Dean Hahn is still with us on the phone. I see his name there. Um, and I've been pretty involved in the Hispanic Advisory Council at the University of Arizona for years and years. Don't, not sure we have something like this, but something that is specific to um, a panel of employees uh, featuring different careers at the utilities, job shadowing, something very particular through the Hispanic organizations that are at the University of Arizona, as an example, Maricopa Community College. Um, but just really good ideas. And I agree with whiteboarding as a next step, uh, as David Adame said, and, and figuring out how can we help make these connections, especially as unfortunately it looks like COVID-19 is continuing. So we're going to be spending another chunk of time here talking virtually like we are today. Um, how can we take advantage of you know this time we have to really strategize and help build relationships? Commissioner Peterson, could I add one more thing? This sure, is Kathy. So we, uh, we also heavily involved in a program called Tucson Values Teachers. And what we do is we support, they come and work uh, for us as interns in their summer uh, time off. And so it rounds out their income um, for an entire year. But more importantly, they help bring, they bring really valuable expertise into our organization, but we also impart a knowledge of our industry back to their classrooms in a way that we we could never do. And so, you know, we have some great jobs at the utility and and would love to, again, see the word get out um, that this is the place to work. We are the employer of choice and uh, the teachers are one way of getting that that uh, message back out to their students. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Pat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd like to pass it back to Jose Perez, the president of Hispanics and Energy, for some closing comments. Thank you, everybody. Wow, what a conversation. That was, uh, I, I tell you, I was not let down. This was uh, incredible. And this is our, our very first one. Uh, I am very thankful to everybody who participated in this very stimulating and robust conversation about something that not only affects uh, our, all, our communities, but uh, affects the, uh, the, our whole country. And uh, we are clearly in a path where um, this information here, this demonstration will be shared with uh, other states. Uh, as uh, possibilities of a pathway to basically come up with the same kind of discussion. Uh, but uh, more importantly, the uh, enthusiasm that was shared uh, by all to uh, get, get to, you know, figure it out and uh, create such a pathway uh, for uh, the kids of uh, Arizona is, uh, you know, that is a, a very stimulating goal. And I uh, want to share that on behalf of Hispanics in Energy, and I know that I've got some of my board members that are here joining us, 
uh, that uh, we are uh, very supportive of this. Uh, we uh, stand ready to help you in any way. Uh, you know, we can uh, lean on our friends in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we've partnered up uh, with the National Science Foundation and other, you know, strategic groups that, uh, you know, should be part of uh, whatever whiteboarding happens to lay out a pathway to create this, this, uh, this uh, opportunity for uh, young people in Arizona. So uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, from my perspective, the conversation we had today uh, was uh, exceeded my expectations. I think it was uh, really an incredible uh, opportunity to not only uh, pull some of the key players together, but uh, to come up with an outcome that uh, is very doable. Uh, and uh, everybody seems to be willing to engage in this fashion. And from our perspective, uh, you know, our goal was achieved uh, with uh, today's session. So, uh, you know, I, uh, on behalf of Hispanics in Energy, we sincerely thank all of our speakers. Uh, we thank, uh, you know, the companies and the community groups and the uh, academicians. And uh, in particular, we thank uh, Commissioner uh, Via Marquez Peterson from the Arizona Corporation Commission. And uh, we also thank uh, Commissioner uh, Satsi Martha Oliva from the Illinois Commerce Commission uh, because without them, none of this would be possible. And so uh, thank you so much. And uh, this session was recorded uh, and uh, we will be happy to uh, make it available to anyone who's interested in uh, using it uh, to share with your teams. Uh, or your networks, and uh, we will be doing the same with uh, our groups. So uh, on behalf of uh, our planning team, uh, Anita Grace, uh, uh, the commissioner Marquez Peterson, and uh, Manuel Rosales, uh, who's uh, out of Washington, DC, thank you so much for uh, devoting your time and energy to help organize these two sessions. And we thank everybody for your participation. And Stand by, more to come, as you can see. And so we're just starting today. And thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you.